Welcome to the show. Today we are joined by Orion Galaxy Kosi, who, if anybody pays attention to Dana White Contender Series, needs no introduction. Orion, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just glad to be back on. Man, it is thrilling. Uh, it's been a crazy week for you, obviously. You were on the show uh, just a couple days before you went out to Vegas, and then Vegas was just insane, I'm sure. And I kind of want to go through it and you tell us how everything went. Uh, start with the transition. You got to Vegas a couple days before the fight. The weight cut the way in. How was all of that? Uh, wake up was always tough. I mean, cutting down to 170 is always a tough time, but it's one of those things too, where I decided during the off season of COVID, I wanted to be bigger and stronger, you know? So my endurance was still there. I was always working on my endurance, my cardio, but I was making myself bigger. So I was kind of bulking that way. I'd have more muscle mass on me for this fight. Um, and I didn't know it was going to be against Matt Ditson. You know, I just knew I wanted to be bigger and stronger going into the future fights. And that's one thing about my training is that I don't just train specifically for strength. So I do a lot of strength, power, power, endurance. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, my cardio is pretty much just high intensity drilling, you know, a little bit of cardio, a little bit of uh, endurance training, but I try to run at least, you know, two miles or three miles every day. And then sometimes I'll just go for a hike or something and swimming. But for the most part, the weight cut is always the toughest. I tell people that all the time, weight cut toughest, Fight's easy. I like to fight. I like to hit people. So it's one of those things where I go out there, I have fun, you know, I'm fully hydrated and I feel great. But it was an amazing experience. Overall, you know, they, they took great care of us. The UFC uh, organization, fantastic. I can't say anything better about it. You know, they did a great job with everything that's going on and what they have to deal with. And so, you know, um, obviously having to wear the mask around everywhere kind of sucked. But in the quarantine, things sucks too. But at the same time, you know, dealing with what we have to deal with, amazing. That's all I can say. And the question on the test is, was it a throat test or the nose test? <clears throat> uh, mine was oral, so I didn't have to do the nasal one. I told yeah. straight up, I don't want to. Yeah, I think I've heard from most people that the nasal one is getting the real bad rap as far as people say that's the worst. So I'm glad you got the mouth uh, one instead. Was How many tests did they do of you when you were out there? Uh, as soon as I got there, they did one. Um, even before, I had to, like, spit in, like, a tube mm. and send it in. And then once that came back negative, I, I was able to fly out. Once we got there, we did a COVID test and a temperature check. Quarantine for 24 hours. Then we were allowed to, like, you know, go to the store if we needed to. So, like, when people are like, Hey, I thought the fighters didn't be us. Like, dude, we're, we're fucking people too. We're not, you know, we're not animals. We're not people in prison. Like, right. we're fighters getting ready to go fight. Yeah. But we also have to make sure our nutrition's on point. And so Sunday was that day for us to be able to get out from the hotel a little bit to do what we had to do at the um, the store. And then Monday, right after the weigh-in, another quarantine. And then Tuesday, right after the fight, I was able to go out and hang out with like my fiance, my family and friends that showed up and the management team. And then we were able to go out and enjoy the strip for the next couple of days. It was, it was a good time. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, well, I'm glad the follow-up to your fight was fun. Obviously we'll get to your fight here because um, it was a spectacular fight. How was, but before we talk about that, how was the training? Were you training in, your uh, hotel area, what, what type of training or just before the fight were you able to get in? Uh, they actually had fitness rooms for us. They had mats for us. The rooms are small, but, you know, the weight cut, um, it went exactly how I thought it would be. The last couple of pounds are always the hardest. Luckily enough, I was able to continue. I, when, I can't sleep, you know, when it comes to cutting weight. You just start burning up. You're hot. You're like... I just want to like take a cold bath, but then you're afraid of taking a cold bath because your body's like wanting to absorb that water. So I was just sticking my body in a freezer. Like, there, like I would open the freezer and stick my head and arms inside the freezer just so I could relax. I even threw a pillow in there for an hour and then I took it out and slept on the pillow and just for a sake of peace. Um, but, you know, we, we got some good drilling in those rooms. My brother and I, I was able to do mitt work with Blackburn and Uriah Faber. I was able to, um, do my jujitsu and stuff like that with both Faber and uh, Wilson, uh, both Brian. So I'm, I'm referring to both Brian's Blackburn and Wilson because they're both Brian. Right. But, you know, it, it was good. It was good overall. They're all there to support me during my weight cut. 
Um, my brother had the easier weight cut, obviously, because he's also fighting at 170. He's just, you know, he's not as big as I am, though, when it comes to the weight cut. Mm -hmm. But it was good. You know, we had a great team. We had everything that we needed, and we were taken care of. All right. Well, that's great. It's good to get the behind the scenes, particularly because of COVID, things being a little bit different. But now let's get to the fight. This is really exciting. Matt Dixon came in 9-0, undefeated, a little bit more hype behind him. I don't know if it's because he fought in Oklahoma. It was a big deal there or whatever. But what did you know about Matt Dixon, um, you know, going into this fight? Um, I knew he'd be super athletic. I knew he was going to be strong coming into the fight. Um, I also knew that he would try to, you know, use a blast double, and he did. In that first round, he did a fantastic job. I was uh, pretty disappointed with my takedown defense. You know, he did a really good job of getting in against the cage and sitting me on my butt. But, you know, I worked right back up. And I think that's kind of what got to him is the fact that in all his past fights, I knew that once he got the takedown, he looks for a way to hold and hold. And then uh, he'll usually get the other people tired from trying to get up and they can't get up. And then he's throwing a few shots here and there, just holding them down, taking his time. But I've also seen his other fights where he's throwing proper combinations. So a lot of people, they didn't respect my stand-up nor did they uh, respect my um, fight IQ going into this fight. You know, they didn't expect me to be able to take his best shots. They thought I was going to get outclassed everywhere. And it was one of those fights where he came in knowing exactly the kind of power I have. And, you know, I, I picked and chose my shots. Um, I set up some shots to set up different feints. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're uh, – all feedback is good feedback in a sense because I saw some people saying, you know, you need to throw more feints. And I was like, you know what? In a sense, you're right. But you're not there in the moment. Like, when you're in the moment, it's one thing. When you're watching on TV, it's like, dude, he needs to be fainting more. But as an athlete, as a fighter, I understand that, you know. And as a kid who played football, basketball, baseball, all sorts of different sports, when I'm watching sports sometimes, the inner fan comes out. I'm like, dude, why didn't you just get that tackle? But you never understand unless you're in that person's shoes. And so during this fight, though, after the first round, I was pissed. I told myself, like, I was in my head saying, that's not happening again. You're going to go out there. You're going to break his will. He's tired already. And Uriah, you know, he was in my corner, and Brian was right behind me. And they're all, he's already gassed. I was like, no, I'm going to go finish this fight now. And I just kept telling myself that. I was like, I'm going to press the pace. I'm going to break him. Um, I knew he was tired when I didn't mean to low blow. You know, I thought I didn't catch him. I hit him with the knee. I didn't realize my foot came forward, though, and hit him. So, you know, that that was uh, something I didn't realize until after I saw the replay. Um, but I knew he was gassed, though. He, he took his time because at the same time, I don't really think I got him that hard. So I knew he was finding a way to reserve that energy. He was trying to get his air back because he was having a hard time in that second round. He was going for those takedowns because he felt the power. He didn't want to really stand and bang. Like he usually does, you know, like his boxing and kickboxing. Um, he usually hurts people. He imposes his will on his opponents. He sets the pace. Whereas in every single one of my fights, I've always set the pace because I have like, you know, that march forward Goku mentality. I had a buddy who put it best. Uh, like he's like, dude, you look like a Terminator out there. He would throw his hardest shots and you would just shrug it off and walk forward. And then he would just back up and in desperation shoot. And I'm not taking any way, uh, anything away from Dixon. Had he not fought me, he would definitely be in the UFC right now. Uh, he deserves to be in the UFC, obviously. You know, he's, he had the opportunity. His management did a bad job on doing any good research on me, though. Let's face facts. It was a terrible job on their part. Uh, the ESPN analyst, who was saying that I was the underdog, There's, I'm the, the reason I'm the underdog is because I'm definitely going to, you know, get outclassed or whatever it was. Um, he needs to do his research too. And I think a lot of people are going to start doing their research a lot better when it comes to fighters who are undefeated. You know, there's a reason, let's face facts. My brother and I were both undefeated, all finishes. And it's stated we're all finishes. And I, you know, there's probably a reason why the Kosi brothers are the headline of the show. Like we're the main focus of that episode of Dana White's contender series, but you know, it is what it is. All hats out to, you know, Matt Ditson, though. He was a strong competitor. It was a fun fight. I'm glad I got the finish, and I look forward to hoping he has a great career. I know he'll either be in the UFC or Bellator very soon after one or two more fights. You know, he's just got to keep his head up high. He, he's a great athlete, and none, nothing but respect to that guy. And uh, for his management, though, you know, do better research on people. 
just because I'm six and oh and I never fought for LFA or SFN or a big event that was ever on Fight Pass. It doesn't mean I'm not going to be more game ready than anyone they've ever faced. Although in that case, on that comment, um, it might have been a good thing that people didn't expect a ton out of you because people have been turning down. You said that in your interview post fight that in California, people started turning down fights for you and your brother because people around there knew. So it might have actually been a good thing that Dana White kind of matches people up that don't know a ton about each other. A guy from Oklahoma doesn't know you from California as much as people from California do. So that might actually be a good thing for you. And when you say, you know, people will start researching you, uh, I know we're jumping ahead and we'll get to the fight again, but jumping ahead, do you, do you welcome people researching you? Because as soon as people research you more for your next fight, that means they're going to have a game plan specific to the Terminator, you know, that, that style. So is that something you've thought about now? What's your thoughts on that? I mean, all my past opponents, they did their research and it was all the same thing, just me breaking their will. And, you know, every single time I fought somebody, they've already said, you know, they, they're going to have the heavier hands. They're going to go out and pick and choose their shots. They're going to make me desperate to get the tape down. They're going to stuff my tape down. Um, you know, they're the better strikers, so they're going to keep the fight standing and piece me up. And every single time, it's the same thing. I, I don't care what their game plan is. I go out there. I have fun. In fact, even when I'm fighting, I'm not thinking. I'm just letting my body do its thing. Uh, you have time to think when you're training. That's when you're supposed to think. But if you're in the middle of a fight thinking, dang, I need to get up, then you're really not using that time to get the hell up. Like You, you got to get up. And that's what I did in my fight. Um, every time he took me down the first round, I worked to get up, except for when I had the arm and guillotine. I wasn't sure if it was in or not. I just figured, you know what? Uh, I heard there's, you know, 15, 20 seconds left. So I'm going to see if I can attempt to go for it. It was, I thought it was in. Obviously, he slipped out at the end of the round. But I told myself right after that, I was like, let's go. Let's make these adjustments mentally right now. And I did make those adjustments. You know, I knew he had a four inch or a three and a half inch reach advantage and mentally prepared myself for the uh, adjustments. But when I'm fighting, I don't think. I just let my body do its thing. Well, on that, your body doing your thing. There in the third round, I think you were about halfway through the round when you got that takedown up against the cage. Walk us through that. Uh, you had him pressed up against the cage, and then you shot for double A, got him down, and then, of course, you worked from there. But what do you think led to you in that flow state to go for the takedown? I heard Mark Goddard telling me, if you want off the cage, get off the cage, because I knew that he was just in a hold, you know. Mm -hmm. I think in his head he thought he was doing enough to grind out the win, and I'm pretty sure that had he got the win, he probably might have got a contract. I don't know how, you know, the thinking goes for that. Um, but I told myself going into the second round, it's one and one, but these judges are biased. They're not going to go for the guy who's a big underdog. They're going to go for the guy that the UFC has already looked at in the past and offered fights to in the past. And, you know, as I'm hitting him, I'm looking at Mark Goddard and I'm just like, he's not doing anything because he wasn't doing anything. Let's be realistic. But at the same time, he's right. You know, if I want off the cage, get off the cage. And so, it's funny because I was like, fine, I'll just – in my head, I just said, it's fine, I'll just put him on the cage. And that's when I started working the double underhooks and getting myself to put him on the cage. And I was just like – in my head, I was like, you know what, screw it, you're right, I'm going to put him on the cage now. But I knew he was done. I felt him when he was pressing up against me. He was he, he was tired. Um, and I don't think that he was gassed because he didn't have a good tank. I just think he was gassed because of the fact that – I was stuffing so many of his takedowns. I was hitting him with hard shots, uh, you know, and I was making him go at a pace that he's not used to. You know, I, I did take the pace of the fight, and that's where I'm comfortable. Uh, I've had people, you know, at training try to go faster than me, and that's fine. They, they can go as fast as they want, but it's also hard to go at a high pace when you have a guy nonstop in your face over and over and over even if you know they're with me against the wall i don't get tired like i'm like all right cool like 
I'm going to work here. I'm going to get things done. I'm not going to show that he has me just stuck here. I'm going to impose my will too. And that's why I was throwing those shots. And I feel like I was throwing some pretty hard shots, even when I was supposed to up against the cage, especially when I was throwing that right hand around and I was slap, you know, hitting that ear because I was using my thumb knuckle on purpose. I wanted to make sure that I was going to try to throw off that equilibrium by either hitting the temple or the ear. And I don't feel like a lot of fighters utilize that, you know, when he tried to change levels and I started throwing elbows, he immediately came right back up. And I'm picking and choosing where he goes, you know, trying to get the clinch, throw knees uh, and engage. And I'm just trying to miss and match it all. But that takedown, I knew I had as soon as I had my arms around his ass. Because I've had other guys that practice try to defend it too. And, as soon, you know, I'll just slowly crawl my hands together. And as soon as I lock, it's over. It doesn't matter if your legs are apart. Once my hands are locked right below your ass, you're, you're going to get taken down. And then I heard Uriah say, oh, he's out, he's out. And I'm thinking, oh, I better hit him then just in case. <laughs> Because after I slammed him, I don't think he was out. Um, I think it was more so like it just took everything out of him. And he's thinking he's got to do what he can to survive at that point. Um, but I just remember Mark being like, coach your fighter. Don't coach me. Shut up in the corner. And, I, you know, in my head, I'm laughing. But at the same time, I'm thinking, like, I don't know if he's out or not. So I started hitting, started going for submission attempts, changing position. And then I know I'm very dominant in side control and half guard. But I told myself, I win this fight and I finish this fight in crucifix. So I went straight to crucifix. And from there, that was the beginning of the end, but I wanted to finish. I, I told myself, you know, even if it's a 10, eight round, um, the judges are probably going to score it, 20, you know, 29, 28 for him. And that's the only time I was thinking, I was thinking to myself, I was like, you finish this fight, you get a contract, finish this fight, you get a contract, push, 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 uh, you know, the judges. I don't like them. I don't like judges. They're always picking wrong nowadays. They don't know what they're talking about. They're pretty shite. But I had a blast doing it. You know, that, that's the one moment of the fight where I started thinking, you know, this contract's yours. You got to get this done. I heard Brian and them yelling short time. And short time for me meant there's only 10 seconds left because mm -hmm. right before the fight, we're all, hey, let's have code words. And only for the timing. Because I heard him and his corner have a code word for the Patterson. Look out for the Patterson. And that meant look for when he switches to southpaw. Because I'm a, you know, orthodox, I'm a switch stance fighter. So I'll go orthodox or southpaw. I don't care. I just like to play with both and uh, throw different things. But and I'm thinking, oh, there's 10 seconds left. So I'm just pounding away. And I hear Brian like elbows, hammer fists, go short time. And I'm thinking, dude, that means 10 seconds. I got to get the stop. Yeah, I didn't realize he was saying that with 25, 30 seconds left, but I'm glad he did that because now in my head I'm thinking I need to hit even faster and even harder. I need to just, just keep hitting him. Do not let – get either arm out. Just nonstop go, go, go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good that you brought up your coaches knowing what to say, even if they use the code a little bit early. It's a good thing because you ended up getting the stoppage 18 seconds to go, and there's always a chance – had you been a little bit less, although you were dominant, had you been a little bit less aggressive, thought that, you know, that you had a little bit more time or whatever it was, there was a chance he would have survived through. Now, in that crucifix, you got the crucifix um, between your legs, but you did work to get his opposite arm um, against your head and at one point against your neck. And at one point he was able to fish his um, hand in front and then it was after that you recorrected it, and then you got the finish. How important do you think it was to be technical? Because a lot of people in in um, in crucifix forget to to uh, stop that far arm. And how important was it to be technical? It was very important. You know, uh, when he fished out the first time, when he got his arm out, yep. that was more so me trying to get higher standing so I could throw those elbows even harder. But then I just told myself, you know, Hey, he's going to get the arm out when he does reposition. So I kept throwing the elbows, the short hammer fist, the, uh, you know, shoulder shrug. And then as soon as he got his arm out, I told myself, stop hitting, attack the arm again. As soon as I planted my head to the map, that's when I knew, okay, just hammer fist. Let's go hammer fist punches. And I knew those punches were landing hard because I could hear the shots and I'm pretty sure like other people could hear the shots too. So I, I know that even from a short range, I've had people in practice tell me, I've had Uriah tell me, like, dude, you hit really, really hard. doesn't matter if you're on bottom, short range. Like, you know how to hit because I'm trying to impose my whole entire body weight into that one little shot even when I'm on the ground. Um, and it's just, just knowing about how to position your hips and using that body weight properly, how you can even when you're on the ground, 
just minor adjustments with your hips while you're on the ground makes the shots even harder. Like it's just constant movement with your body to make it more energetic into the shot. So kinetic force pretty much. I mean, I, there, there's science behind it, but I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to pretend to be a doctor or a scientist, but I, I just know, you know, for myself, it works and it makes it to where I do land harder shots when I do it. So I'll leave it at that. Well, what you're describing there is the difference between a punch that lands with force and what we call an arm punch. And you know what an arm punch is when somebody particularly yeah. in weird positions just kind of wings wings it and they're not they're not connecting their core to their hip to their knees or wherever they're planting um and actually you've mentioned two times now we're trying not to give too much away for your future opponents but you've mentioned two times now where you are creative in how you throw punches obviously the finish it's rare to see somebody finish with their head planted on the mat and they're you know punching like that but you did that very well obviously you knew how to link everything together but also you were talking about around the back of the head punch where you get legal because you're on the other side. Um, how much work do you put in on being creative in finding ways to strike in a way that most people just wouldn't do? Honestly, man, like I said, I don't really think when I fight. So it was like my, my body just doing its thing. I, I'm, like, I'm seeing it and my body just like, <laughs> it's like, go for it. Like, just, just do it, you know? Um, but I like to be creative when I'm doing stuff. There's a couple of things I still have never used in a fight just because if my body's not just doing it naturally, that means, you know, I don't have to do it. If my, if I'm just going out there, I'm not thinking and I'm doing the right things, then that means that's what's right. That's what's going on. That's what's good. Uh, I just, um, there was a couple of positions though, where Ditson did a really good job at getting out of the clinch at the right times. You know, when I threw, uh, I, I, I was about to land a really nasty right elbow in the second round. We were clinched up, and I threw a knee, and he backed out perfectly because I threw that right elbow, and it barely missed. Or, uh, you know, when I was throwing that uppercut from hell, uh, I came over with the left hook. He did a great job keeping his distance. He knew, like, if those shots land, those are putting him out because he came into the fight knowing I had power. He knew how strong I was. He knew I had what it takes to hurt people and drop them and knock them out. And if I don't knock them out, then it's definitely stunning them and it's rocking them for the rest of the fight. So I feel like in the first round, I may have hit him with a shot or two. I don't know. I still haven't seen the fight with uh, commentary or heard it. I've only seen bits and pieces of my fight still. I, I, you know, I need to go and take a look, watch the fight, hear what I hit him with. I did watch it with no audio. Mm -hmm. and I was able to see what shots rocked him, what shots made him, you know, oh, I need to go and try to take him down. That one hurt. And there, there's quite a few of them. Every time I hit, it doesn't matter. I don't have to punch hard to hit hard. I know how to use my body weight. But it's one of those things, too, where I'm still crafting my skill because, like you said, it's a little unorthodox. I'm finding new ways and methods to hit people from different angles. And so in that fight, I remember I missed on a left hook and I came back with a, uh, you know, a back fist. It wasn't a spinning back fist, but I hit him with the back fist. The hook missed and I came right back up, at, you know, like a De La Hoya uppercut, you know, that, um, like a slanted uppercut almost, but it was with a back fist. And I know that landed, and so that, you know, like stunned him a little bit and he backed up because they hit him with the wrist and not just the glove. So I'm always like letting my body just do its thing, having fun when I'm in practice. I'm actually practicing that. If I miss, I come back with like a little bitch slap or something. Well, you're bringing up all the important things of being creative in how you find ways. You, you think about now, obviously not to make this about Sean O'Malley, but it's probably been only two years since that low calf kick has come in. And you got to think whoever first started it, and there's some debate on who started it, um, there was a time where nobody thought the low calf kick would do anything, and it can score now in ways that that the typical above the knee can be blocked and checked. So it's always interesting to see how, as people get better at certain scenarios, um, I was going to say it's probably been Randy Couture, and of course that's a great comparison, who really yeah. – ground and pound and you know your official stoppage is recorded as ground and pound which is cool to see um i believe that's your official stoppage and it's been a while since somebody was known for ground and pound um and is that something that you're happy you're kind of reinvigorating what ground and pound looks like 
Yeah, I mean, I, if uh, people want to put me as that guy who's, um, you know, getting ground and pound back into the game, because you're right, we don't see that a lot nowadays in the uh, – MMA world, like they, people use ground and pound to try to set up a submission. They don't really use it to finish the fight. Whereas I'm telling myself, I want to finish the fight. I didn't see the fights um, from that Saturday, but I heard Daniel Pineda. He uh, had a topside crucifix. I don't know if he stopped the fight in the topside crucifix. Did he? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I believe he did. You're talking about UFC 252? Yeah. So I didn't watch that fight, but I heard about it. Um, and so it, it was cool to hear that another guy as well yes. got the crucifix to finish. I didn't know that he finished with the crucifix. I, I just know that he beat the younger Burns brother. Right. And, uh, you know, and I was thinking, oh, you know, that's a really good win. You know, um, Burns, Burns is good. You know, he just had a very good dominant outing in this last fight. I think it was a submission win, I believe. And, you know, Pineda, he came in and he dominated in that second round. He came out and he got that top advantage position and he took control and he finished in the crucifix position. But that is a position I don't feel like a lot of MMA fighters utilize because they're not comfortable there. And maybe it's because in practice, they don't know how to settle their weight in both the arms and the hips. Whereas I've wrestled my whole life. I'm used to getting that position. You know, I purposely will work with people who weigh 215, 230, 250 just so I can put him in a crucifix position. And if I get him a crucifix, my job is, hey, man, this is a big dude. He can explode at any time, and I need to keep him down. So I feel like that also helps me learn to keep that body weight down. I heard people being like, oh, man, you know, if Matt Ditson knew how to defend crucifix position, it's like, well, it's kind of hard when you have a guy who's used to holding down 200 plus, 250 plus men in a crucifix position as if it's no problem. You know, I just know how to use my hips. I know how to readjust my weight where I need to go. I know how to, like, you know, um, in, in a sense, it's like a feint, you know, uh, a, like a give and take. Give a little to get more. Let them think, hey, this is my opportunity. And then real, they realize, dude, that was not it. Like, they just set me up for something even worse. So, you, like, re with wrestling, there's fainting for wrestling. But on – the overall aspect of the ground and pound, you know, I'd like to be known as a ground and pound guy, you know, if I, I like to finish the fight anywhere. I've had a standing TKO where I've just mentally broke the dude third round. He wasn't able to fight back. I just kept hitting him with elbows, knees, power shots over and over and over and picking and choosing. And then right after the fight, he, you know, he just sat against the cage and slid down. Like he, he was done. He was mentally done. He was, you know, after the, uh, at the end of the first round, I knew that, you know, my power is too much. I've had other fighters where, you know, I get, a, um, I like to call it like a grapevine, but like a Saturday night ride, you know, in wrestling, Saturday night ride, you have the double leg ride, you're, hooked, you know, hooked in. Had another fight where I finished it just like that. Uh, two fights, actually, where I finished it with the Saturday night ride. So, yeah, um, I do have a lot of ground and pound finishes, but if more fighters learn to utilize their whole entire body weight during the ground and pound, they would learn like you can actually get knockout shots while on top. You don't have to be in a full mount position in order to get uh, a knockout finish, or you don't even have to be on top to get the knockout finish. That's why when I was throwing strikes from the bottom, I'm thinking I'm going to hit him right in the ear, throw his equilibrium off. A lot of people don't realize that if you, as a fighter, start to use science behind why you're doing certain movements while you're training, and then you put that into a fight, you're going to be better off. You'll understand what's happening. You'll understand what's going to hurt your opponent and where you can start winning a little bit easier. And that's a great mindset because a lot of people when they're on their back and somebody's either in their guard or mounted, they forget that for the person on top, they usually completely abandon protecting their head because yep. they're thinking it's just all domination from here. And a lot of guys, they practice that position on like a bag dummy or something on the floor, which yeah, as you know, which doesn't hit back. And I've seen a lot of guys kind of, their defense breaks down because they're not used to people uh, being, like you were saying, being aware of how they can fight back. Um, yeah. I believe, I believe, just to let you know on the Daniel fight, I believe he finished very similar position. Um, I believe he finished with really tight elbows, kind of in the same position you were, but just like like you were cutting a carrot. I think that's what he was doing, just like up and down with his elbow. Whereas, yeah, exactly. Whereas you had. Uh, the more of the fist involved um, but it, it's a good example because you're a young fighter 
he would be considered a veteran. He's been around the sport for a while. He was, I think, 34 range uh, age-wise. And so it's, it's great that you're getting you're way above your experience level. I think that's one thing. Have fun listening to the, the audio commentary, but I can warn you ahead of time, they didn't really start warming up to liking you, I'm just telling you, until probably the third round where they started saying, wow, look at, uh, you know, look at Kosi, it's a 10-8 round, he's dominant, stuff like that. Um, but I think, it is, I think it is valuable coming out of this fight for you to recognize that you're fighting at an experience level well beyond a guy who's seven and zero, and obviously that's testament to you and your brother, your coaches, your eye of favor, how you guys train. But but I think the UFC is going to get used to that. Speaking of you getting the contract, because obviously we're, we're focused on what that looks like. Is that a set number of fights? Because obviously Dana White contender series contracts look a little bit different. Is it already a done deal, or are you still? kind of not sure on the number of fights and the length of time. Because usually for the UFC, it's either a length of so many months, so many fights, a combination. What does that look like? Um, if I'm – I think I'm allowed to say it. Uh, if you're not, a, don't. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. It's uh, four fights or two years, whichever comes first. But I like to be very active. I've already told my manager. My brother's told our manager that we want to get at least – two, three, and possibly even a fourth fight before the end of the year or before January. Um, this time next year, I'd like to have between four and six fights. You know, um, I get it. I'm, I'm the young up-and-comer, but I am 26 years old. I want to be able to get those fights out of the way, get those, uh, you know, the, the small paychecks mm -hmm. said and done. You know, I got to be smart about who I pick and choose. You know, I'm not going to. He told, hey, we're going to give you, you know, a top 10 guy, but we're only going to pay you 10 and 10 or something. So I know what I'm worth. I, I know my value, especially if my brother and I are on the same card. We'd make history again. Uh, I'd love to do that. That's something I personally would love to do. I've talked to my brother. He'd love to do that too. We know exactly how much more attention that would garner for us, how much, many more opportunities that would open doors. And it would be history in the making for the UFC. Why wouldn't they want to do it? It looks good for the UFC. It looks good for Dana. It looks good for ESPN. It looks good for the MMA world to have brothers who just made history on Dana White's contender series go out and do history again by being the first brothers to ever debut in the UFC on the same card and then, you know, make history by being the first brothers to debut and win on the same card. We already did that with Dana White's contender series. Um, we're down to do that for the UFC as well. Well, and it's great that you bring up the fact that you and your brother really made a ton of history, got a lot of attention on you, also on the Lost Boys Gym, which probably doesn't get mentioned a lot in UFC, so it was great to see some attention. And if you watch towards the end of the broadcast, I think it was um, one of the broadcasters mentioned to Dana um, on the broadcast that you and your brother would actually like to fight as soon as possible. And he responded positively to that. I think it's because in the COVID world, the fighters that want to fight have been picking up fights more often because the yeah. fighters that are kind of either not training or caught up with COVID or just want to stay away, they're kind of letting time elapse. Um, when, you, when you think of making history um, with your brother, is it important for you to, to get in that, people are already commenting very soon about how you guys look like the Diaz brothers, you know, where, you you know, and so what's it like to know that those comparisons are being made and that you guys, I think it was, might have been Lewis mentioned your game plan for where you guys want to be as far as champions go. It could have been you in the broadcast, but talk about, talk about your comparison to the Diaz brothers and then also your comment that you would go 85-70 and that Lewis would go 55-70. Yeah, no. Um, you know, we grew up, and our favorite people for siblings in sports to watch were the Diaz bros. We, we grew up watching them. I actually met Nick Diaz a few years back, and I've met Nate Diaz at the fights, um, you know, that were in uh, Reading. You know, Brian Wilson, he's a promoter as well as a coach. And uh, – you know, we, we saw Nate Diaz there, so we said, hey, what's up? How you doing? And, you know, to us, it was one of those things where it was like, that, that was kind of a huge influence. Like, you see these brothers, and they're fighting, and they're in each other's corner, or they're at each other's training camp. We're like, dude, we're doing that already. Like, you know, uh, 
I, I don't really know too much of their bad story, so I'm not going to go and be like, you know, our story is similar to their story because they grew up, they grew up differently than we did. They grew up in Stockton. We grew up on the reservation in the woods. Um, but I'll never take anything away from what the Diaz brothers have done as siblings in the sport. You know, they, their name is there for a reason in the sport of MMA, not just the UFC and the sport of MMA as a whole, though, people know the Diaz brothers worldwide. And that's something I think me and Lewis will be able to do as well. Um, people know the Pettis brothers, but you know, the younger Pettis isn't as well known as the older Pettis. Same with, you know, a couple of other people. I, I know there's like the Miller brothers, the Burns brothers. Um, I think there's a few more brother duos out there in the MMA world right now. But I think one thing that helps too is our, is our background is how we were raised is how we grew up, what we dealt with the adversities we overcame and how we're just always there for each other. You know, my brother said it himself. He's like, if it wasn't, you know, for my older brother, I'd probably be on drugs doing nothing with my life right now. But it is also the same vice versa. Like if I didn't have my brother Lewis, like what would I be doing? And so we were always there to help each other, take care of each other. We grew up with multiple families, you know, our families uh, in general, the people who did uh, help raise us, they did the best they could for what they had, but I also believe a lot of them, you know, make excuses because of their past uh, history. So the way Lewis and I saw it was, we don't want that for ourselves. We don't want to grow up in that cycle. We want to break the cycle. And we were always told by people growing up, fighting is not a career. It's, it's not suitable. You don't know if you can make it. It's like, no, no, no you're just a doubter. You don't know if we can make it because you're not the one putting in the hard work every day. You're not the one making the sacrifices with family and friends or a night out with people or, you know, going on a vacation somewhere because you want to make that sacrifice to become the best of what you're at. And a lot of people realize, you know, in order to be a champion in the sport or to be, you know, well known in the sport, you got to be willing to make those sacrifices. And one thing I'll say, um, you know, I, I'm a no-name at this point. I, I consider myself a no-name, but I feel like we as brothers will come up very fast in the sport just because of how we fight and just because, you know, we're real people. We're not going to sugarcoat things. When I was asked, you know, is there fake-ass people in the UFC? And I said, they're all fake. I meant it, you know. We hear about these guys that, you know, this is, I was told I need to get Twitter so I can stay more socially active with the fans and stuff. And I get it. But I deleted Twitter. A uh, while back, I, I guess I had like an old account that I had. I, I didn't realize that. I had another one I deleted. I thought I deleted both because of how fake people are on uh, social media, just in general. I kind of don't follow a lot of fighters. I don't stay in touch with a lot of the UFC guys or Bellator because let's face it, they all, you hear these stories about how like, oh man, they're so great in person compared to what they are on TV. And it's like, wait, what do you mean? They're like, dude, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in real life. But then you go and watch them on TV and they're like talking bad about people's families, uh, kids, religion, um, their history, like where they're, everything. And it's just like, that doesn't sound like a good person to me. That sounds like a fake motherfucker. Like, that sounds like one of the fakest people I've ever met. But, and I get why some people do it. You know, they're being told like Colby Covington, his situation. And I, I still stay to this day, he's fake because of the fact that he didn't stick to himself, uh, his true self. He used to be one of the most, um, humble people in the sport, but then on his way to go fight RDA, he said his manager gets a phone call that the UFC is cutting him. Win or lose, they're cutting him. He's, he's not garnering enough attention. And then that's when he drops that bomb about Brazil. And so everyone's like, dude, crazy. But then all of a sudden he said, if I didn't do that, I still would not be in the UFC. But now he puts on all those antics. And it, it got to a point like, you know, same with McGregor. He used to be like Mystic Matt. But then it became to a point where he started getting people's country, religion, family involved. Whereas at first he didn't do that. He made a personal just, hey, this is a fight between me and this person. I feel like I'm better. I'm going to knock them out or finish them in this round. But then eventually the hype got on too much. He had to do more and more and more. And I feel like that's something the UFC needs to start cracking down on. Because I've said it in, uh, in other interviews, if I have a guy come up face to face, if they try to put their hand on my cheek, you know, and like try to press – I'm knocking them out right then and there. Either that or I'm going to break their jaw or their face. Like, I don't do that stuff. If people are talking about my family, if they're talking about my people, the religion, background, stuff like that, keep everyone else out of it. Keep everything out of it today. 
when it comes to me, you can say whatever you want. You can call me ugly, stupid. You can bring up something from my internet history. Oh, look at this stupid photo of him and his walking around a singlet in high school. What a loser. You can do that. That's fine. Don't talk about my family and friends. Don't talk about my religion. Don't talk about my ethnicity. They don't get to talk about that stuff. I'll let the UFC know. It's on site. If I hear a single word about it, it's on site when I see them. Because I've heard about that. You know, um, That was another thing, too. I, I'm not going to drop a name, but there was a UFC fighter on 252 that was going around talking trash, and his camp was talking trash. But then in person, they're all acting cool, and it's like, nah, nah. You know, if you want to do that for social media purposes, be like that in real life, too. And I'm that kind of person. If I'm going to talk trash to somebody on the internet, I'm probably going to talk trash to them in real life because I either A, don't like them, or B, they're not my homie. Like, there's a difference between talking shit with your friends and then talking shit with somebody you don't know. And that's the way I see it. So I'm just going to keep it real with people. Uh, the Diaz brothers, I think they did a great job with that. You know, uh, Nate Diaz, he was in the Ultimate Fighter house, and he straight up said, man, I'm only here to fight. I'm not here to be your uh, friends. You're not my friends. But he ain't down like that. And I agree. You know, me and Matt Dixon, we weren't friends. So going into that fight, I wasn't going to be all lovey-dovey and sugarcoat him and be like, no, you know, I think he's fantastic or phenomenal. I said what I said. I said I was going to go and finish the fight. Yeah, it was the wrong round. I said I was going to finish him in the first. I feel like I was going to finish him in the first. But that's also my confidence, you know. And Matt, he had that same confidence too. He said, you know, there's levels to it. He didn't feel like I was on his level. And I respect that in a sense that – and I took offense to it, but at the same time I respect it because it just goes to show he wasn't being fake. He was never fake once. He never talked smack on social media. He never um, talked trash at the way in. And I respect that as a fighter. So after the fight, you know, him and I, you know, we exchanged some words, but they weren't hurtful words. They weren't words of like, you know, I hope your career goes to crap. I told him straight up, hey, man, um, you know, thank you for, you know, taking the fight. You know, you're, you're a great fighter. You're a great athlete. You'll, we'll see each other again in the future. I look forward to, you know, you being in the UFC. And he told me, hey, man, you deserve this. You're, you're a great athlete. You won fair, you know, he, he was humble about it and I was humble about it. And that's the way it's got to be. But if I have a fight come in and the guy's talking smack, Guess what I'm probably going to do after that fight? I'm going to get in their face, probably talk smack. Or, you know, might take the humble route. Who knows? It just depends on what they're saying. If they talk about me, that's one thing. Don't talk about anything else, though. I'm not that kind of guy. It's on site. Well, I appreciate you uh, pointing out some of the things behind the scenes in the UFC. Like, you mentioned Colby Covington by name, so we can, we can use that as an example. And Chael Sonnen's another great example. No one had ever heard of Chael until he started some really ridiculous things that were clearly ac across that line many times. Um, right. But one of the things I think that's interesting is you and your brother get the opportunity to establish what the Kosi brothers are going to be as far as your attitude, as far as your mentality. Um, and I think it's important for people to know that fighters behind the scenes are under pressure to finish in certain ways, to trash talk in certain ways, to physically look certain ways. I mean, Sean O'Malley always had some great tattoos and stuff, but his hair went from being just regular brown to like multicolored and good for him. And I, I'm glad he's got that look, but a lot of that is pushed to, to present a certain image, you know? I feel like a lot of fighters are doing it because they know that the more they do, the more notoriety they get. And it doesn't matter. Remember, bad press is good press it means people are talking about you uh but at the same time too it's one of those things where a fighter will choose and dictate how they're going to be i've heard sean o'malley is actually a really nice kid um when he's not fighting when he's just outside not doing pressers he's actually really nice but then when it comes to the show you know he's, he's talking a big game on social media he, I, I don't really know. Again, I stay off Twitter. I guess a lot of fighters are on Twitter. This is the reason why I'm being told, hey, man, you got to have a Twitter. It's like, for what reason? Um, I'm only going to do it just so I can be like, hey, guys, here to fight. It's what I do. You know, you're going to see a bunch of Dragon Ball Z anime geek stuff. I'm just going to post a bunch of memes. Like, it, it, that's what I do on my social media. I like to post memes. Like, I'll post the dumbest shit that you've ever seen. But that's also my style of humor. Um, I'm not going to change for anyone, you know, if later on down the road, I'm being told, hey, man, you, you got to do something about your character. It's like, if you don't like who I am as a person, you know, that's not my problem. I, if I offend you, that's your problem. I feel like I'm a very 
modest, humble person, you know, there's times where I can be a little shithead. I'm not going to lie, you know, again, but that's more so with my friends. If I'm going to be talking smack with my friends, that's one thing. Um, but I'm not going to go out of my way to start trouble or anything like that. I'm not going to go and try to be an ignoramus. I'm not going to be an asshole to people just for no good reason. Um, you know, if someone's an asshole to me, I'm going to be an asshole back. But there are times when I know take the high road. If I'm out in public, if I hear somebody talk crap, just, you know, it's, it's just words. But one thing I won't stand is if someone comes up. Because as soon as they step up, they get in a certain zone, you know, it's game on. And that's the way it's got to be. Like I said, the whole entire on-site thing. Um, I, I'm just trying to keep it real with people. Mm-hmm. But there are fighters, like you said, Chael Sonnen, perfect example. No one really knew who he was until he started saying what he said. But at the same time, I've also heard he's one of the most chill people to ever hang out with. And it's so crazy because you hear that, you know, dude, I think that guy would just be a jerk off. And they're like, no, honestly, just one of the most humble people. But Chael knew, in a sense, how to get – people to watch it was kind of like comedy it was like wwe tv like you know when they're all talking smack but then there's chill talk and then there's talk where let's face facts mcgregor versus khabib perfect example khabib said after the fight what was gonna happen he said it leading up to the fight what him and his team were more than likely going to do after khabib took uh, the championship what the game plan was the ufc knew the security knew. Everyone acted surprised. Um, and, you know, I, I'm probably – I'm one of those people too. Khabib, he keeps it real. He, You know, he never talked about people's religion. He never talked about people's families or wives. He never talked about kids. He, he never talked about anything. He only talked about the fight and how he thought, you know, I'm going to go out there and smash. Like, that's his thing. He, he's going to go out there. He's going to take him down to the – waters and drown them he's gonna make them you know dig deep but then take away their hopes with his fighting and he does let his fighting do the talking he, he doesn't try to trash talk his opponents he's always very humble um and i respect that. that that's something i respect i respect when fighters do that you know so like colby Covington, back in the day i respected him more as a fighter but then the antics i get it he had to do it for his career his career was on the line he came out and said that in an interview i believe a while back but it gets to a point now, it's like, dude, the world knows, like, you did it for a reason, so where's the humble fighter now? Or are you going to keep the antics going? You know, uh, Chael Sonnen, uh, his thing worked out because his was actually funny. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't racist about it. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't an asshole. He, he was an asshole about it, but he was funny asshole about it. He wasn't racist, um, you know, talking about people's religion, talking about their wives asshole about it. He just said things about the fighter themselves. He never brought up anything else. And I feel like if fighters did that, it'd be good for the sport. But you know what? A lot of MMA fans nowadays, like the casual ones, they love seeing that shit. They love seeing people talk about, oh, man, that's bad blood. It's like, but is it? Because then you hear about all these fighters who were talking trash to each other afterwards Mm -hmm. and how, like, you know, oh, yeah, you know, we fought and we shot the shit. And it's like. Nah, I wouldn't shoot the shit with anybody who just got done talking about my fiance or my brother and his kid or my family. Right. I would be like, yo, I'm glad I whooped your ass. Go fuck yourself. Right. <laughs> and I would never bring their family up. I would never bring their religion up. Mm-hmm. I just tell them straight up, you got your ass whooped. Take it like the bitch you are and get the fuck out of here. Well, you mentioned Habib and kind of that attitude he had with the Conor McGregor. So I'm going to bring up a potential dream fight, with is, which is Habib and GSP. Have you heard that that's going around. I mean, there's a chance that'll happen. And not only is it a great stylistic, both of those guys let their fighting do the talking. And I think GSP and Habib are both great examples of guys who are are really about the sport. You know, they're really about, yeah. they want to hurt people. They want to do the best. They want to be legends. They're both legends already, but they don't go sidetracked. They never go sidetracked as far as some of the other stuff. So when you, so when you think about GSP and Habib, fighting just in a dream sense how do you think that would go the fighter in you the fan in you i mean first and foremost we got khabib versus gatchi and that yes. right there is a dangerous fight already um Absolutely. you know gatchi he has that prior wrestling experience but we haven't really seen a lot of his wrestling lately so i feel like khabib if he gets into the ground he's going to be able to you know impose his will on the ground but i don't know we don't know until we see the fight. So that right there already is a good matchup. 
when it comes to GSP, I respect the man. I actually had um, the opportunity to meet him a couple of years ago when I went up to TriStar and trained for a couple, um, like a, about a week, week and a half. And so I got to meet John Chainberg and all those guys. And, you know, I, I still talk with John uh, every now and then to catch up with him and see how him and his family are doing, especially during COVID. You know, he's one of the best fitness coaches in the whole entire game. Like he, he's known around the world for a reason. You know, the, the man's, I don't know how old and he's super ripped. <laughs> Like that, that man knows what hard work and dedication is. And he also knows what it takes to be a good, uh, you know, man to his uh, kids. He's, he's a great father. Uh, now GSP, when I got to meet him, super humble, uh, very respectful. And what you see is what you get with GSP. That was the cool part about getting to meet him too. And, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, uh, the sport and styles of wrestling and everything like that. But, to be honest, I don't feel like he should get the opportunity. I feel like if anyone gets the opportunity, it's because it's Khabib. You know, Khabib has wants that fight because he wants to people to know I'm the greatest of all time. But it's like he doesn't have to beat GSP to be considered the greatest of all time. If Khabib beats Datsji and then fights the winner of either – it sounds like it's either going to be Poirier versus McGregor too or, Por, uh, you know, McGregor-Ferguson. It just depends because obviously, you know, when he, he has a lot of respect for Poirier because Poirier is another great example of what it takes to be a humble fighter in the sport. Um, if he does talk trash, it's only going to be with his opponent. He doesn't bring up other factors unless, mm -hmm. you know, their teammates are talking trash too. But I would love to potentially see uh, if Khabib does get by Gafchi, mm -hmm. then – you know, we, we have a couple of different matchups that we're looking at, but I honestly don't feel like a guy who came out of retirement just to go back into retirement deserves a shot at another championship just to retire again. If anything, I mean, if GSP could do that, you know what? Yeah, he is the greatest of all time. You know why? That means the guy took three years out of the sport to come back, take the 185 title, to retire for another couple of years and then to take the 55 title. It's like, that just goes to show he can just come out of retirement at any time he wants, Yeah. but it's a slap in the face to all the athletes who are active. And the only reason GSP gets that title shot at 55 is because he's GSP. It's not because he's GSP, the fighter who's been active in fighting other active roster athletes. It's because he's GSP. He's in the UFC hall of fame he gets to bypass that. And it's good for TV. Let's face facts. It's all about TV ratings. I, I've understood this before, and I'm never going to change what I say. It's political. But let's go with um, Khabib. If he gets past Dasji, uh, Gafji, I like the idea of either McGregor versus Poirier, winner of that, or McGregor versus Ferguson, and then the winner of that, depending on if Poirier is not injured or um, – you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple of different fighters at 55 right now. It's, it gets a good division. Now, but on that topic too. of 55, it, it may help you to know that it's been very clear that Habib, whose father recently passed from COVID, yep. um, that that is 100% Habib's dad's plan for him to fight GSP for his 30th fight and retire undefeated. So that's been very clear. Just Just in case you hadn't heard that, they've been very clear. On that, it's, I'm sure it's about the UFC making money too, but that's something that uh, Habib's well, coach. That, out of respect for his father's last yeah. wishes, you know what? That man was a legend in the sport as right. a coach and as a person. So if that's his last wish and if the UFC is going to give that to Habib, if he gets past uh, Gafchi, then right. yeah, give it to him, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, Habib as an athlete, he deserves that big payday. And let's face facts, he, he gets those big paydays, he, you know. But um, that it, it'd be a phenomenal matchup to see because I have GSP on the stand-up, but now when it comes to the MMA grappling, it's like you never know until the fight happens. Yeah. So as a fan of the sport, I'll say I'm excited to watch the Gafchi khabib fight and then see what happens after that. Um, you know, and I think I've heard a little bit about that. But at the same time, too, I don't try to get too much into the um, the lies of the other fighters or the drama of the mm -hmm. other fighters. Uh, you know, Khabib, he, he needed his time to mourn. When people were trying to be like, hey, you know, like, COVID is fake. It's like, I'm one of those guys who's like, you know, you can't use COVID as an excuse to not train. But it's different when you lose a family member. And mm -hmm. Khabib did. So it's one of those things where, you know, pray, uh, prayers to him and his family. Mm -hmm. 
But I hear other fighters who aren't being affected by COVID saying, you know, oh, you know, I had a tough camp because I wasn't getting to the gym. It's like, you're a fucking liar. You were able to find some sort of training. I wasn't in the gym for about a month and a half because the gym wasn't open, right? Um, I was outside training. I went swimming, hiking. I found ways to train outside. I wasn't out of shape going into this fight. I was in top-notch shape. Um, you know, my opponent, Matt, he said the same thing. He was able to train. He was training for a fight in August anyway. He got given this opportunity, and he was going to take full advantage of it, and he had a full camp. You know, a lot of fighters, I feel like they're using COVID as an excuse, saying, hey, man, I feel in the best shape of my life, and then they lose, and all of a sudden they're like, yeah, COVID affected my training. Mm -hmm. The weight cut didn't go as planned because of COVID. It's like, no, it's because you're being a poor excuse of a son of a bitch and making excuses for why you lost. It's like you lost because you weren't the better athlete. Mm -hmm. You lost because you weren't the better fighter that night. But during COVID, you know, people just need to go out there and be safe. Um, if you're not going to be around people, obviously, you know, that's smart. And that's what I did. You know, I just, me and my fiance would go up to visit my brother and train and hang out with my nephew because he loves to see his uncle. And we'll always talk about Dragon Ball Z. He'll be like, my nephew will straight up be like, uncle, who's better? Goku or Vegeta? And I'm like, oh, who do you think is all Goku? Because Goku always wins. And I'm like, all right, there you go. Yo. You already know the answer. <laughs> Or he'll look at my dragon tattoos. Oh, is that Goku's dragon, Uncle? I'm like, yeah, it's Goku's dragon. I was like, what's his name? Oh, Goku's dragon. I just said it. What? Did you not listen? <laughs> so he's a little smart ass himself too. But um, now during this time, I think a lot of people need to remember like social media and media in general, it's all scare tactics. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying COVID isn't as bad as people are saying it is. What I am going to say though, is if people were off social media a little less or even like news media a little less, They'd be able to go outside and enjoy nature a little more. Sure. Well, that's that's actually good advice. Um, my last question to you would just be: you mentioned it several times. Since you want to stay active and you want to fight, let's say in a month or two months, or probably within a month or a week for you, you'd fight tomorrow. But did you take anything away from your training? Do you want to tweak it, or are you good with where you are as far as the COVID training, the training? with Uriah, how's all that looking? If you're gonna stay busy, what does that look like for you? I'm back in the gym on Monday. I'm okay. gonna be back in the gym on Monday, going fully at it again. Um, not as intense, you know, Monday will be more drilling, you know, going slowly back into it, just because um, I just wanna keep my weight down and um, active, you know, instead of walking around at 205, 210, I'll be walking around around 190, 195 mm -hmm. now. And the reason I got big is like I said earlier, uh, in this uh, podcast with you is that I was trying to put on size. I was trying to be a bigger athlete, but I've already done all that now. You know, I can do all my power lifting. I don't have to build for size and strength anymore. I can build for power and strength while maintaining my weight around one, one, uh, 190, 195. So instead of having to cut weight, because I have a heart condition, muscle valve prolapse. Um, mm -hmm. So instead of doing a weight cut that takes about two months or a month and a half, you know, I'm ready to cut weight within two weeks. And that's the kind of fighter I am. You know, I've done last year three fights in five weeks. And that's because I was just ready. I kept my weight down. You know, I wasn't going around um, eating a lot of, like, heavy uh, meats, like steaks and stuff like that. That way I could just, like, let it recover for the next day or heavy carbs. That way I'm able to do multiple training sessions in one day. What I'm doing is higher protein, higher fats with still moderate carb. I'm not doing a keto diet where I'm getting rid of carbs. I love carbs. You got to have carbs, especially if you're training two, three times at a very high level. And a lot of people forget that. They're like, no, as an athlete, you don't want carbs. It's like, yes, you fucking do. Your body wants carbs. It craves carbs, but it also craves healthy fats, craves proteins. You still need to make sure you're getting your antioxidants, minerals, vitamins in you, whether that be from, you know, a multivitamin or just natural intake of uh, lean meats, fruits, veggies, et cetera. You, you need to find a way to get that all in you especially if you're training as a high level athlete. I train two to three times hard every single day. Um, even on my rest days, I'll find a way to stay active. It's moderate activity for about an hour to two hours, but I can't just sit and lay around. Even when I'm injured, I can't do that. I have to stay active because I know that there's somebody else out there who wants to take me down. 
So even if I have like a foot injury, I'm finding a way to like do stairs. Even if it hurts, I'm just walking. I don't care if my elbow hurts. Okay, I'm not going to grapple today, but you know, does it, is it fine for me to do jump rope? How do I feel doing this? Can I do pull-ups? Okay, I can't do any of that. Well, then I'm just going to work my lower body. I'll go for a hike. I'll go swim because it's, you know, less resistance. I'll wait in the pool. I'm always going to find something to do. Well, it's been incredible getting to know both you and your brother having you both on the show. The biggest congratulations to both of the Cozy brothers. And I can't wish you more best for you and your family. And obviously your nephew, I got to see some photos of him on Facebook. He's a cute little guy. So um, best wishes to literally your whole camp. Everybody can't wait to have you on uh, the next time you've got a fight coming up. So uh, thanks so much for taking time out of your celebration. This is a crazy week for you to celebrate and spend time with your family and friends. So. Best wishes to you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thank you so much. It's always a blast. And the, when I hear that I have a, another fight coming up, you're definitely going to be one of the first people to know. I enjoy talking to you. Well, I can't wait to have you back on in the future. All righty. Take care. All right, bud. Thanks a lot. Take care.